Dude, we are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Seamus and Notch is a great idea. Hello and welcome to The Debated Podcast. I'm your host Conrad, I'm joined by my co-host Will. Hello. And today's guest is a journalist for National File and The Political Insider. It's Jack Hadfield. Hi guys, great to be on. So um, first sort of question is, um, obviously, how did you first get into journalism and sort of writing for these websites? Well, it was really just a, an accident of circumstances i um i campaigned for the uh, conservative party in the 2015 election on their big uh, battle bus thing which uh, i think was eventually mired in scandal at the end i think i was aware uh, with conservative future and that getting shut down and that but um anyway i i met uh, this guy there um charlie at the uh, victory party in July that year. And he said, um, oh, yeah, you know, do you want to start writing for my little website thing? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. But I, I, I had never considered um, journalism as, as a, well, uh, as an opportunity in the past. Um, and But I thought, you know what, let's, let's just go for it and see how it goes. And, um, yeah, so I started writing this little thing called the, the Squid Magazine, and uh, it got to the point where, um, through various things, we were interviewing uh, Milo uh, Yiannopoulos. And, you know, uh, we, we, we were quite excited about it because he was a quite a big uh, figure uh, back at the time. Obviously, he's dropped a bit off the radar now. Uh, but we were interviewing him and he said, look, guys, uh, Breitbart is starting up. Um, you know, they're giving me their own vertical, which is the uh, tech section. And we need reporters. So would you guys like to come write for us? And we were like, hell yeah, obviously. You know, this is sort of, you know, uh, this this dream come true. Obviously, Breitbart being this, you know, um, the biggest sort of, um, I, I guess, sort of alternative media. It certainly moved more into sort of um, regular media now. But certainly at the time, it had this sort of um, punkish vibe, you know, uh, where, uh, yeah, where, where, where they really seem to be breaking the mold and sort of pushing stories that uh, other people weren't writing about. So yeah, it was really a dream come true. And this was so I went into my first year at university, and I think on on my nineteenth birthday, I wrote my first article for Breitbart, and it was actually about uh, Warwick University and the consent classes. Um, so, you know, uh, two weeks into my university career, I'm already causing trouble. <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's sort of the um, quick backstory of how I got into uh, journalism and media and that. Um, now, you mentioned um, the piece that you wrote on the consent classes. And uh, if I recall, you got quite a bit of uh, uh, backlash for that. How did you react to that when you saw the reaction from from people who had read the piece? Well, yeah, there certainly was a, a little bit of backlash, but thankfully it was nothing really compared to uh, what my friend uh, George Lawler, who wrote the original piece in the tab that I was responding to. Uh, he, he, you know, he, I think he, he put a photo on, photo on his Facebook, he hold of the, uh, the, the book, you know, so you've been publicly shamed. Uh, you know, he, he was getting stuff from because the story went international. He was getting stuff from people all around the world. And I only got a little small taste uh, of sort of the viciousness that some people could have for putting out their opinion. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I mean, since then, I've had lots of uh, nasty messages and you know, and Twitter DMs. And since the past, um, certainly the first time it happens to you, you know, you are taken aback uh, quite a little bit at how at, at how mean some people can genuinely be uh, having a difference of opinion. Um, but, you know, that's the internet, and I've certainly got used to it now. And now, you know, if somebody sends me hate mail, I consider it a little badge of honour that I've managed to annoy somebody that much with, you know, my ramblings that they feel they need the time to come and swear at me online. Uh, now, and as part of your um, current work at the National File, you went to CPAC in America. Um, what was that like? Oh, sorry. I think I just uh, mute my mic there. Um, yeah, it was wow, I, I, an incredible experience. Um, 
obviously for the for, for, uh, for those of you um listening to podcast now i don't know it it's uh it's really the the equivalent of conservative party conference but in america and non-partisan so um it's not so there are lots of republicans there i quite i met quite a few congressmen matt gates paul gosar um you know there were loads obviously uh president trump himself uh gave a speech and i, I was lucky enough to see uh, even though i was at the back of the room i managed to get onto the uh, well, because I was press, I managed to get onto the uh, balcony where all the cameras were, where people were uh, recording it. So I got, you know, a relatively recent view. But um, yeah, it was insane to see all these people that, you know, um, I've, you know, watched and listened to on- online. And then, you know, they're all in this place. You know, obviously, um, Alex Jones uh, was there. He was at uh, one of the events, some of the events the National File hosted. Um, Michelle Malkin, you know, uh, the conservative commentator, who's really big on um, uh, border control and immigration and issues like that. Um, so, yeah, it was certainly an incredible experience um, and uh, definitely one that I recommend. But I, 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 uh, I definitely caught something when I was over there because on the, on the Sunday and on the way back, I was just coughing and spluttering. And, um, and it turned out there was somebody at CPAC who actually did get the coronavirus uh, so I was certainly concerned uh, that, that I might have caught it for a bit after that. So that was the only downside. Uh, I came back and had about uh, 10 days of just uh, coughing my lungs up. Uh, but other than that, you know, uh, if if, you know, uh, you are a conservative or, or, or even just anybody who's interested in politics, uh, you know, if you can afford it, I would definitely recommend uh, going over there at some point in your life. Um, now, you mentioned uh, that it's uh, equivalent to, say, the Conservative Party conference. Um, What do you think of the differences in approaches to conservatism in the United States as compared to the UK? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a tough question. Um, But really, I think the fact that American conservatism, well, if you sort of um, say American conservatism pre-Trump, then it's pretty obvious to see what the differences were in that American conservatism was really just uh, classical liberalism, you know, in that it was all focused on rights, freedoms, liberties, you know, uh, small government, you know, uh, cutting taxes, cutting government debt, uh, very much focused on the economy and the free market. And that was the stuff they um, promoted now, as opposed to sort of English conservatism, which has always had um, that Burkean heritage and the idea of um, sort of Hobbes and more of, of, the, of the natural order of things in that um, in that uh, American uh, conservatives, you know, um, that they, they, they would always been worried about uh, using the government, um, whereas British conservatives um, never really had those qualms in doing so. Um, yeah, so c- certainly the the use of the government um, is something that they would. Um, yeah, that was certainly a big difference. But with Trump, you're starting to see people more like Tucker Carlson coming up in the conservative movement, who um, are more into promoting stuff like the family. And I think uh, the Tucker Carlson versus Ben Shapiro debate that was done a couple of years ago, I think on on Shapiro's Daily Wire. Uh, podcast you can really see the the two trends of american conservatives and with ben shapiro being the classic american you know all about you know free market and you know uh you're, you're not entitled to anything just the pursuit of happiness kind of thing and tucker carlson speaking about how the free market is not a god you know um capitalism is not some nicene creed that we worship um, and was more opposed uh, as more creating about creating families and communities and something that looks more like traditional English conservatism. So there is, seems to be this merge together of the two conservative traditions where, um, yeah, the, the, the American conservative movement is moving away from this really classical liberal trend with perhaps some vaguely social conservative values to something that is, yeah, more, more akin to British English conservatism. Now you mentioned that after you got back from the conference, you you were ill, and obviously we've got the coronavirus pandemic going on at the moment. You know, maybe you had it. You don't. You haven't been tested, so you don't know. Yeah. What is your view on the sort of way the situation's been treated across the world and in the UK specifically? 
Well, yeah, I certainly started uh, the uh, with, with the pandemic, thinking, "Oh, yeah, you know, it's just a flu, bro." Um, and but so, and thinking that, "Oh, we'll all blow over." You know, we've had bird flu and Ebola, and that didn't really affect anyone uh, in the end, like in the grand scheme of things. Obviously, you know, there were, it was serious, but it was nowhere near the scale that we've had now. And as it's um, gone on more i've started to think that yeah you know um i really am glad that well certainly i think with even within the last half an hour or so uh rishi sunak announced 330 billion pounds i think uh in you know government spending going to businesses to keep them afloat and you know i i i i wrote a story for the national file um just uh at the weekend which talked about all the new powers that I think the legislation is going to put, be pushed through within the next two weeks in terms of uh, shutting down ports, uh, potentially closing down pubs, restaurants, um, et cetera, giving police powers to detain people who have been suspected for having the coronavirus and so on. Um, I'm certainly glad that that, uh, that the government has turned around from its um, previous uh, way of, of tackling the coronavirus, which talk about herd immunity and things like that. I think they've admitted that that would certainly cause a problem. So there has been a quick turnaround today um, on that. And yeah, it's certainly glad to see, you know, governments actually taking charge and doing stuff that they can to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. It's certainly annoying with people who are saying, oh, you know, well, especially especially Americans who have this anti-government trend, uh, as I mentioned earlier, who, who are talking about, oh, no, you can't um, stop us from going out. It's my right to go and do this. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, if you do that, you're probably going to end up killing people um, from spreading this uh, virus about. And uh, and uh, you know, uh, people in the 70s are saying, "Oh, you know, I'm I'm fit and healthy. I cycle eight miles a day. I'll be fine." It's like, yeah, but you're still in your 70s. Your immune system's weaker than everyone else, and you're at greater risk. So certainly, the people who really aren't taking this seriously are definitely a threat to everybody else. And yeah, the, uh, I'm I'm very glad with the responses that western governments are taking in order to crack down and yes stop st and stopping this pandemic from becoming something akin to the spanish flu um now you mentioned the intervention from uh, the government relating to the coronavirus but of course, even before uh, we've seen the uh, measures that are in place at the moment, uh, we were seeing in the uh, budget uh, greater uh, government <clears throat> Uh, involvement in the market and things like that. Um, how do you, how much government involvement in society do you think is appropriate? And what was your reaction to the recent budget? Well, I mean, so the the question about government involvement in society is certainly one that um, really changes uh, with the time. Certainly, in terms of uh, crises like this. Um, I don't have a problem with the government stepping in to do what it takes to stop society from completely internally collapsing and stop the, stopping the economy from going into a crippling recession. Um, but most of the time in general, I think government generally needs to step back um, from, from society and let people operate as they would. I think most of the problems now that uh, now that you see in society have been caused by over government over government intervention um however in order to fix these things you ironically need need somebody in government to sort of reverse them because uh once they've been checked for example um you, you know with uh mass migration for example uh that was a you know uh blair opened the borders in 1997 and allowed what was between tens of thousands of migrants per year to uh, multiple hundreds of thousands and obviously that was a huge effect on society um but you couldn't just say okay great and government steps back and sorts it no you would need the government to come in for example and and reduce immigration that's sort of a, a, an example of things that where uh, governments made the problem, but it's also such a problem that government needs to fix it as well. Um, but yeah, certainly, I, and with regards to the budget, I haven't had uh, a look at that much in general, uh, but certainly I think the um, the, the levelling up agenda 
that uh, Boris promised in the manifesto to towns uh, in the north and the Midlands, which uh, didn't seem to get the uh, benefits um, of the uh, growing economy that we've had since the Thatcher Revolution and fulfilling the promises in the manifesto, um, I think were really important. Um, I think that really now uh, keeping those northern seats that Boris won in the 2019 uh, general election is certainly something that's um, more important than necessarily, you know, paying down the debt or, um, you know, trying to lower taxation or so on. Uh, there's definitely we need the big uh, infrastructure spending, certainly that they announced and just reinvestment to again in these places, which, again, which is a problem that government caused when Thatcher shut down the mines and so on. Um, yes, obviously, they were uh, losing money, but then they were like, oh, it's fine. You know, the market will take care of it. But nothing came in to replace it. So you need government to step in, uh, invest in these areas and bring back um, uh, businesses and revitalize the economies of these areas that have been left behind. So, yeah, I'm so, yeah, the budget last week uh, was really good. And certainly, and again, to reiterate, um uh, Sunak's uh, spending of 330 billion uh, to help with the coronavirus outbreak is something that I can very much get behind. Now, um, you've, um, across the pond, we've got the Democratic primary, which is still going on as 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 we record. Though there is a um, few primaries today, so who knows what the case will be by the time this actually goes out. But as it stands now, there are still two candidates: Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. Do you think either of these these guys would be a threat to Donald Trump, or which one do you think would be the greater threat out of the two? Well, I mean, you know, just to be clear, there are still three candidates standing. Obviously, with my, well. my my favorite uh, <laughs> Tulsi Gabbard. You know, look, guys. You know, mm. I mean, she's still in the race. You know, she hasn't dropped out yet. So technically, there's still three in there. Um, but yeah, you know, she she has absolutely no hope. Uh, even though I think, you know, personally, she would certainly be. Uh, the, the like the best out of the three to actually uh, beat Donald Trump, but yeah, with uh, with Biden and Sanders, um, yeah, I don't think there's any way that either of them uh, could beat Trump. I think it's almost a done deal, sort of touchwood that he would win in uh, uh, in November. Um, Biden certainly, you know, he's he's well, you know, he 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 likes sniffing uh, hair. You know, he says weird things about when he was used to be a lifeguard and hang, hang out with people with really random names. And he seems to have some form of dementia slash Alzheimer's uh, with his amount of gaffes. Yeah, I think he couldn't remember what God was. He confused. Um, uh, I think when he said he was trying to work with Xi Jinping, but he said he worked with Deng Xiaoping, who'd been dead for 20 years on reversing climate change. Uh, yeah, the the amount of gaffes just isn't normal. I certainly think a Biden Trump debate, uh, you know, Trump would absolutely tear him apart. Um, you know, uh, people say that um, Sanders would be able to win back the Rust Belt states like Michigan and Wisconsin and so forth. Um, but in terms of uh, getting out one of the crucial uh, votes for the uh, Democrats, the the African American vote, uh, he would do horribly on that. Uh, uh, and, and I think that, you know, like Corbyn, uh, people would say, oh, you know, but he, he he's getting the youth and he's re-energizing them. And it's like, yeah, no, it's it's not going to work. Um, so, yeah, I certainly think we're going to see a second term for Trump. Do you not think that, that if there's a recession, which there most certainly will be, caused by coronavirus, that that would have an adverse impact on Trump's re-election chances? I don't think so. I mean, you know, you just said it yourself. It's been caused by coronavirus. You know, this is something that Trump can say, look, you know, the economy was doing great. You know, this is all, uh, you know, you know, we, you know, we had the stock market up to whatever thousands of points. Um, but, you know, what what's happened with something that uh, was completely out of anybody's control. And in fact, it almost vindicates uh, Trump's agenda. I think there have been a number of think pieces saying that, you know, the coronavirus outbreak is, you know, crushing globalization dead. Uh, you know, as people are saying, as people have been worried about supply chains getting stuff out of China, they were saying, "Well, I think there's an executive order that's being drafted up uh, now uh, 
by uh, Trump's trade guy um, who are saying, you know, we're getting China out of the medical supply chains um, because this is something that we need to produce ourselves. And I think, uh, yeah, c- certainly in certainly in terms of, um, yeah, Trump's trade war against China, Trump's policy towards China, um, and in terms of how integrated they are with the U.S. economy, you know, Trump can point to that and say, look, and and again with Trump's, uh, I think um, people were uh, before the outbreak really came to the U.S. He proposed a travel ban from China. Uh, people were saying the travel ban was racist, and again, Trump would be able to point to that and said, you know, the coronavirus outbreak here wouldn't be as bad if these people hadn't tried to, um, you know, stop me from tackling these issues. So yeah, I I certainly think that uh obviously there's going to be problems with the economy uh but nobody could uh blame it on trump and if the democrats if the democrat nominee tried to blame it on trump then the american people would uh definitely reject that narrative i just wondered what um your reaction would be because you mentioned some of the um gaffes uh, with joe biden and some of the forgetfulness what your reaction would be to people who might suggest oh well the same could apply uh, to President Trump, how, how how would you respond to that? Oh, there's there's no comparison. Uh, you know, Trump may say idiotic things from time to time, uh, but he doesn't seem to have the you know constant you know as you may say you know brain farts that Joe Biden seem uh, seems to have. You know, the fact that you know you could set, you could probably point out Trump's cafefe tweet as as you know uh, this thing, but yeah. Biden, I mean, it, you you could even compare videos of Biden from now to four years ago or eight years ago. If you look at him, he just seems like a completely different guy in uh, in speaking. Uh, you know, Trump, you know, may, uh, may say things wrong at the time. I think um, he, you know, uh, swore under his breath while he was, uh, uh, while um, C-SPAN were uh, still uh, broadcasting him before a an address on the coronavirus last week but you know it, yeah it's absolutely nothing compared to um you know biden's clear you know memory problems do you um do you think that it was the right thing to hold the primaries today that are still going on um the ohio governor delayed the ohio primary until um i think june whereas the Florida, Illinois and Arizona primaries are still continuing. Do you think that's the right decision or do you think they should have been delayed as well until the outbreak is under control? Yeah, I certainly think they should have been delayed as well. You know, if you're getting, you know, hundreds or, you know, thousand people at polling stations, you know, casting their votes and especially uh, older people, you know, that is like the number one, you know, place where people could certainly get infected. Uh, So it's, I, I I definitely respect the the Ohio governor for shifting um, back this primaries again. Yeah, you know they've got lots of time anyway before the uh, DNC and RNC, which are in July and August respectively, uh, I believe. Um, so yeah, they've got more than enough time um, to get this all sorted out um, before the actual general election. And yeah, people's health and safety really does need to come first um i wondered what your thoughts are because we're not only going to be seeing a presidential election this year but we're also going to be seeing uh, elections to the senate what do you think are the chances of the republicans maintaining control of the senate yeah um yeah i i I haven't actually looked at the uh states which have the senators going up for election this time around um, but I think they have a decent chance. And certainly, you know, if Trump wins the uh, presidential election, you would expect that you would have this uh, coattail effect um, where uh, Republicans are more likely to win their races. Um, but, you know, I think, what is it, 52-48 currently in the Senate? Yeah, um, yeah it's it's really, really close. Uh, and it could certainly go either way. Yeah, I think it's, uh, isn't it 53-47? But that includes oh, Mitt Romney. Oh, I don't, know if, you, I don't oh. know if you'd include Mitt Romney. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, the yeah, answer course. Well, I think Romney proposed uh, UBI yesterday, didn't he? Temporary UBI for the coronavirus Yang. outbreak. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, so it may turn out that Andrew Yang is the real winner of, um, of, of, of this crisis after all. 
uh, you know, you know the, uh, the, the Neats are finally going to get their Yang bucks. Um, you know, uh, all, uh, all thanks to the coronavirus. Um, but yeah, as I said, it certainly it depends on the electoral map, depends which states are going up. As I said, I, uh, I'm not 100% sure which senators are up. Uh, going up for re-election, you know, it's obviously like uh, like British Council elections, obviously, which were uh, delayed this year. Uh, but you know, if you if you're having a load of uh, rural councils, um, you know, all being elected, you know, it, it probably wouldn't be a surprise that the Conservatives are going to win uh, most of them again. And if it's a lot of urban councils, you know, uh, Labour, you know, usually wins most of them. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it, it's it's just a question of. The electoral map, uh, who we've got coming re-elected, and yeah, it's, it's going to be pretty close. But I think the Republicans have got enough wiggle room that they will maintain control of the Senate. I can't see the Democrats necessarily taking it back. Um, now, the, overall, the picture on the um, the right is sort of sort of seems to be moving in a more kind of populist direction. What do you think the role in sort of technology and the internet has been in this? Um, movement Hmm. yeah well i i certainly think that the internet has well uh, what the internet and social media done what the sorry what the internet and social media have done is uh sped up change massively in terms of the democratization of information you know if you compare now to 20 years ago you know where could you get your news you know you would get it from the newspapers television radio and maybe if you were you know, uh, a weird geek, you might, there might be some couple internet forums, you know, uh, around at the time, but certainly, you know, people would get their information, their arguments, you know, they would get them from, you know, these mainstream sources. Whereas now where you, where you have the internet, where you have social media, where you have YouTube, um, people are exposed to a far wider range of opinions, both on the right and the left. Um, and you're really seeing, um, you know, uh, the uh, political establishment not being able to control the flow of information. And again, that, that people are exposed to stuff that um, that that they might agree with. Uh, and well, it's certainly uh, I, I've um, I have my views now because I've spent, you know, uh, years uh, on the Internet from from school, you know, be it, uh, Twitter or Tumblr and, and Facebook and uh, and and youtube and seeing stuff that i wouldn't have seen seeing arguments that i haven't been exposed to like i became um pro-life because i was uh you know it was something i didn't really think about but then somebody exposed the arguments to you know uh, for me and i was like oh yeah that actually makes a lot of sense you know that would have never happened without the internet certainly i think um people's views are being uh broadened and their uh, people are a lot more open to um different ideas uh and the flows of different ideas um but of course then uh the the problem some of the problem with the social media is that it can become uh, a bit of an echo chamber uh so certainly um you have to make sure you're keeping being exposed to uh different ideas and different ways of looking at things uh so that you know you don't get stuck into just a small community and you know you go down like conspiracy theories and you know, think that old oh, man didn't land on the moon and you wouldn't be listening to and you wouldn't be willing to listen to anybody who tells you otherwise uh so certainly that's that's the downside that's comes with this but yeah the um the internet uh social media and the yeah democratization of information and communications has been yeah certainly uh has been a net positive uh, overall now we're just going up to the end of the podcast, um, but I've got one final question. Now, obviously, you you've had to isolate due to your symptoms, and a lot of people are having to isolate themselves for a bit longer. What do, what do you think is the best sort of thing to do if you're isolating in terms of entertaining yourself? What's the what 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 will you do to entertain yourself? Oh well, I, 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 I'm 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 a regular listener to the debate podcast, so I was wondering what my final question uh, would be. Uh, oh God, I should have expected this one. Uh, the topic. Um, uh, I've well, uh, a, a friend of mine messaged me earlier and asked me for um, uh, a lot of Netflix recommendations, and pretty much all uh, every film and TV series I put to her, she'd already watched. Um, so perhaps uh, you know, if 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 you're 
somebody who uh, who does a lot of binge watching already, uh, you might want to uh, switch it up. Uh, maybe read a book. Uh, you know, go on a walk um, and stay two meters away from everyone at all times. Um, or just sleep. You know, if you're not doing anything else with your day. Um, but right now, me, I'm being um, uh, productive and just spending my time. Uh, yeah, just getting things done that I needed to do, ticking off my list. You know, get my room tidy, getting things organized, and um, yeah, so I'm I'm spending the coronavirus outbreak uh, getting stuff done. Well, I think uh, one one thing that if you're really nerdy, you could do uh, is you could be like Isaac Newton when he uh, uh, confined himself to his house during the uh, Great Plague in 1665, and he uh, calculated pi to about 20 places um, by hand. It took him. Um, hours and hours and hours and days using this uh, really long mathematical formula. So, if you're into that, may- maybe uh, maybe have a crack at that yourself. Well, that's I think that's a good answer. So, um, thank you for joining us, Jack. Um, feel free, feel free to if you want to come to the podcast again, we'd love to have you on. Um, Absolutely. And thank you to everyone for listening. If you want to get in touch, you can go on Facebook, Debated Podcast, on Twitter, Debated Podcast, and email us at thedebatedpodcast at gmail dot com. You can listen to us on on iTunes or on Spotify, Podbean, all sorts of places. Um, so make sure you subscribe and keep an eye out for the next episode.